Hi everyone, Teacher Janet here. Welcome back once again to my educational channel on biology. Let's continue with subtopic 8.3 on gaseous exchange in humans. The learning standards for today's lesson are as follows. We should be able to communicate about external and internal respiration. And this includes gaseous exchange between lungs and blood, transport of respiratory gases from lungs to tissues. Number three, gaseous exchange between blood and tissues. And number four, transport of respiratory gases from tissues to lungs. So by external respiration, we mean the process that also involves gaseous exchange of oxygen and carbon dioxide. Right, in the two places, between lungs and blood, and also between blood and tissues. So our topic is gaseous exchange and the transport of respiratory gases. And some students are a bit confused in this section, right? But if you study systematically, it's very easy, actually. So there are four parts that we're going to study. Firstly, gaseous exchange between the lungs that is the alveoli in the lungs or alveolus in the lungs and the blood. For example, how does oxygen diffuse from the alveolus into the blood? Okay, and then next we are going to study the transport of oxygen from the lungs to the body tissues. So oxygen will be transported in the blood to the heart first and then it will be pumped from the heart to the body tissues. But how is it transported? In what form is this oxygen transported? So we're going to discuss that. Now next, we're going to study gaseous exchange again, but this time it's gaseous exchange between the blood and the tissues. For example, how does oxygen diffuse into the body tissues or the cells from the blood? How does carbon dioxide diffuse from the body tissues into the blood? Now fourthly, the last part is to study the transport of the respiratory gas, namely carbon dioxide, from the body tissues to the lungs, right, for excretion. So we're going to use the numbering system here, the numbers here, to help us identify the four sections, right, as we study them systematically. First of all, let's try to understand the meaning of the term partial pressure, the partial pressure of a gas, because this term will be used in the, the explanations for gaseous exchange. Now, gaseous exchange across the alveolus occurs by diffusion and depends on the difference in partial pressure of a gas between the blood and the alveolus. So what is the definition for this term partial pressure? Partial pressure of a gas is the pressure or the force exerted by that gas component, such as oxygen, when it is in a mixture of gases. For example, when oxygen is together with uh, carbon dioxide and other gases in the atmosphere. Okay, So take, for example, a container like this. And you have two gases here. So this is a mixture of gases. We have gas A denoted by the blue a particle here and uh, we have gas B denoted by the green particles. So gas A will exert its own pressure on the container as it is moving randomly, right? Actively and randomly the molecules are moving and colliding with each other and also knocking into knocking the walls of the container. That's when it produces the pressure or the force. Alright? And then its uh, pressure is called PA here. Now, gas B, there are less of uh, gas B particles. So they are also hitting the walls of the container and exerting the pressure or the force on the walls of the container. And they exert a pressure called PB, right? So the total pressure of uh, the gases in this container is P total. So it comprises or is made up of PA, the pressure exerted by gas A, and PB, the pressure exerted by gas B. Okay, so we refer to the partial pressure of gas A here 
as a PA. It is the pressure of force exerted by the gas component such as gas A when it is a mixture of gases that is uh, together with gas B. It is mixed together with gas B in the container. Okay, so the more the number of gas molecules, the higher the partial pressure. So when we say uh, the partial pressure of the gas is high in the atmosphere, for example, the partial pressure of nitrogen is high in the atmosphere uh, because there is a, a large number of uh, nitrogen molecules in the air, in the atmosphere, all right? And uh, that causes the partial pressure of the nitrogen gas in the air to be high. So the second thing we need to know is a gas always diffuses from a region of higher partial pressure to a region of lower partial pressure. So it diffuses from a region where there are lots of a lot of these molecules to a region where there are fewer of these of its molecules. So let's calculate the partial pressure of uh, the gases in the atmosphere to better understand the meaning of the word partial pressure. Now, atmospheric pressure at sea level is 760 millimeters of mercury. Okay, so atmospheric pressure can be measured in terms of millimeters of mercury, right? So it's 760 millimeters of mercury. And as the atmosphere consists of 21% oxygen by volume, the partial pressure of oxygen will be 21% of 760 millimeters of mercury. Okay, so 21% is 21 over 100, so it's 0 0.21. And then you will get this answer. The partial pressure of oxygen in the atmosphere is 160 millimeters of mercury. Okay, so the oxygen pressure or the partial pressure of oxygen in the atmosphere is 160 millimeters of mercury. Now, how about carbon dioxide? So first, we have to know the volume of carbon dioxide in the air in terms of percentage. Now, by volume, air contains 78% nitrogen, 21% oxygen, 0.9% argon, and 0.03% carbon dioxide. Okay, so with this information, we can calculate the partial pressure of carbon dioxide. Okay, and also with the knowledge that the total atmospheric pressure is actually 760 millimeters of mercury. This is the total atmospheric pressure, right? So what is the partial pressure of carbon dioxide? Can you try and calculate this based on these two, in, uh, these two uh, details here? Right, so the answer is 0 0.23 millimeters of mercury. How do we get that? You take the 0.03%, right? So 0 0.03 over 100 times 760. And then you end up with this value. So because the volume of carbon dioxide in the air is, by volume, uh, by volume, the, the amount of carbon dioxide in the air is only 0.03%. There are very few carbon dioxide molecules in the air. Thus, the partial pressure of carbon dioxide is very low. It's only 0 0.23 millimeters of mercury compared to oxygen, which is 160 millimeters of mercury. So here's an interesting diagram. It shows us the partial pressure of oxygen and carbon dioxide in various parts of the body. So the partial pressure of oxygen and carbon dioxide is not the same in different parts of the body. It depends on where the oxygen or carbon dioxide uh, diffuses into, right? And also other factors like cellular respiration. For example, inhaled air, which is air from the atmosphere, has a high partial pressure of oxygen. Uh, as we have uh, calculated, it's 160 millimeters of mercury and a low partial pressure of carbon dioxide, which is 0 0.23 millimeters of mercury, right? So for the rest of the partial pressures, we do not really need to memorize the values in green, but just that we must know whether the parts of this, these parts of the body have high or low partial pressure of oxygen and carbon dioxide. Okay, that's uh, that we have to take note. So blood that leaves the lungs 
con through the pulmonary vein here has a high partial pressure of oxygen because oxygen has diffused from the alveoli into the blood, right? And it has a low partial pressure of carbon dioxide because some carbon dioxide is diffused from the blood into the alveoli to be excreted. Next, the blood is brought to the body tissues or cells. Now, in body tissues or cells, the uh, cellular respiration causes the cells to use oxygen, right, in cellular respiration. And cells also release carbon dioxide in cellular respiration. So cells have a low partial pressure of oxygen because oxygen is used in cellular respiration. And they have a high partial pressure, pressure of carbon dioxide because carbon dioxide is produced in cellular respiration. Next, uh, diffusion of oxygen from blood into cells occur, right? So the blood that flows back to the lungs here, through the pulmonary artery here, will contain a low partial pressure of oxygen, since some of the oxygen has diffused into the cells in the region of the body tissues to be used for cellular respiration. And blood that enters the lungs have a higher partial pressure of carbon dioxide, okay, compared to blood that leaves the lungs. Because the blood that enters the lungs uh, have, has received the carbon dioxide from the body tissues, right? Carbon dioxide is a byproduct of respiration and the carbon dioxide diffused into the blood to be transported to the lungs for excretion. So exhaled air that is exhaled from the lungs has a lower partial pressure of oxygen compared to inhaled air because some oxygen has diffused into body tissues. And exhaled air has a higher partial pressure of carbon dioxide compared to the inhaled air because some carbon dioxide has diffused from the body tissues into the blood to be so that the carbon dioxide can be excreted from the lungs, okay? So now, with the background knowledge of partial pressure, let's start discussing 8.3, gaseous exchange in humans and the transport of respiratory gases. So, partial pressure of oxygen and carbon dioxide. The direction of diffusion of a gas like oxygen or carbon dioxide depends on the difference in the partial pressure of the gas in the two areas. That we are discussing. So if there are two areas uh, which has a gas like oxygen, then if we know the partial pressure of the gas oxygen in the two areas A and B, we can predict where that gas will diffuse into, all right, from where to where. So a gas will always diffuse from an area where its partial pressure is higher to an area where its partial pressure is lower, okay, from region of high partial pressure of the gas to region of low partial pressure of the gas, that is down a partial pressure gradient. Just like when you run, you come down from a hill, going down from high to low, right? Is, is a, that is how the partial pressure gradient works, right? The gas will diffuse from region where there is a high partial pressure with a large number of the molecules of the gas to a region where there is low partial pressure of uh, the gas. Right, and we can say that it's, it uh, diffuses down a partial pressure gradient. Right, so now let's discuss gaseous exchange between lungs and blood here. Right, now this diagram looks a bit uh, complex, but it's actually not. We just take note of three places in this graph. Okay, three three parts. The first, the location of the lungs. Right, and then this is the heart here. Heart is needed, the heart is needed to pump the blood under high pressure to the body cells, right? And below here, we see the, the organs. These are the parts that contain the body tissues that need oxygen and that use up oxygen in respiration but excrete uh, carbon dioxide, right? Produce carbon dioxide. And also above the lungs here, these are the tissue capillaries in the head, right? In the upper parts of the body, so these are also uh, this in this this area here. There are also body tissues, right? So lungs, heart, and the rest are body tissues. So let's first discuss gaseous exchange between lungs and blood. So our first topic in this video here is to explain gaseous exchange between lungs, which contain the alveoli or alveolus, and the blood. 
six marks. This can be asked as an SPM question, either in the structured, structured questions or in the essay questions, right? So firstly, when we talk about gaseous exchange, we must be aware there are two gases involved, the diffusion of oxygen and also carbon dioxide. Some students uh, miss out this carbon dioxide. They just write about oxygen, all right? So remember, two gases are involved here for gaseous exchange. Next, to explain the uh, movement of oxygen, the diffusion, diffusion of oxygen. Okay, take note first, it is between the lungs and the blood. The gaseous exchange is between lungs or the alveolus and the blood, right? So compare the partial pressure of oxygen in the alveolus with that of the blood capillaries first, and then state where the oxygen diffuses into. So firstly, in the lungs, huh, the partial pressure of oxygen in the alveolus is higher than that in the blood capillaries because this air in the alveolus is actually air that's inhaled from the atmosphere. So it has a high partial pressure of oxygen. High PO2. P is for partial pressure. O2 is for oxygen. Okay. So high partial pressure of oxygen is rich in oxygen compared to the blood capillaries here which have low partial pressure of uh, oxygen because some oxygen from the blood had already diffused into the body cells to be used for cellular respiration. So this blood that's brought to the lungs from the body tissues contain a low level of oxygen. It's deoxygenated blood, right? So in the lungs, the partial pressure of oxygen in the alveolus is higher than that in the blood capillaries or sometimes it's called the lung capillaries. Thus, oxygen diffuses from the alveolus into the blood capillaries down the partial pressure gradient. Okay, that means from region of high partial pressure to region of low partial pressure of oxygen. Next, the oxygen combines with hemoglobin inside these erythrocytes or red blood cells to form a compound called oxyhemoglobin. Right, let's talk about carbon dioxide. So again, we have to state the difference in partial pressure of carbon dioxide uh, between the blood capillaries and the alveolus. Now, in the lungs, the partial pressure of carbon dioxide in the blood capillaries here is higher than that in the alveolus. Why is that so? Because carbon dioxide has diffused into the blood capillaries from the body tissues, which carry out cellular respiration and produce this carbon dioxide, right? So body tissues produce uh, carbon dioxide and then this is a byproduct of respiration. So this carbon dioxide diffused into the blood and this blood is then brought to the lungs so that the carbon dioxide can be excreted. So the partial pressure of carbon dioxide in the blood capillaries is higher than that in the alveolus. Thus, carbon dioxide diffuses out from the blood capillaries into the alveolus, again down the partial pressure gradient, that means from region of high partial pressure of carbon dioxide in the blood into the alveolus, the alveolus that has low partial pressure, lower partial pressure of carbon dioxide. Next, the carbon dioxide is expelled into the atmosphere through the nose and mouth during exhalation. So imagine that the oxygen has diffused from the alveolus into the blood, right, in the lungs. Now, next the blood will leave the lungs and is transported by the pulmonary vein back to the heart. So that the blood, this is oxygenated blood, huh, which contains a lot of oxygen, so that the blood, this oxygenated blood can be pumped to the body tissues, right? So we're going to discuss the transport of the respiratory gases from lungs to tissues. And this respiratory gas that we're going to talk about is oxygen. How is the oxygen transported from the lungs to the body tissues after it has diffused into the blood, all right, in the lungs? Right, so in the second part of our video here, we are going to discuss or explain the transport of oxygen, a respiratory gas, from lungs, from the alveoli in the lungs, to the body tissues.
all right so this can come out as an exam or SPM SPM question right so take note six marks first of all we are going to discuss the diffusion of oxygen from the alveolus into the blood which we have discussed just now huh? so I'll just repeat the partial pressure of oxygen in the alveolus is higher than that in the lung capillaries or the blood capillaries here in the lungs so oxygen diffuses from the alveolus into the blood okay from region of higher partial pressure of oxygen in the alveolus into the blood next the oxygen combines with hemoglobin a protein in the erythrocytes or red blood cells to form oxyhemoglobin so this term oxyhemoglobin is very important right and equation chemical equation is hemoglobin hp stands for hemoglobin plus 4o2 so one hemoglobin molecule binds to four oxygen molecules to form oxyhemoglobin hbo2 bracket 4 all right now this is the chemical equation is for your understanding and uh, the word equation is important for us to remember here hemoglobin plus oxygen hemoglobin plus oxygen in the lungs when there is high partial pressure of oxygen will form oxyhemoglobin all right thus oxygen is transported from the lungs to the body tissues as in the form of uh, oxyhemoglobin oxygen is transported in the form of oxyhemoglobin from the lungs to the body tissues or cells now what happens when the blood is pumped by the heart and reaches the tissue capillaries or the blood capillaries in the region of the tissues okay body tissues such as in the liver kidney and other organs of the body right in the arms and legs all these are tissue have tissue capillaries so this blood is oxygenated blood now because the oxygen it is rich in oxygen which is transported in the form of oxyhemoglobin so next how does oxygen diffuse into the body cells again we refer to partial pressure the partial pressure of oxygen in the blood in the blood that is oxygenated is higher than that of the body cells because in the body cells cellular respiration uses up the oxygen okay the body cells are constantly carrying out cellular cellular respiration to produce energy so they use up the oxygen they use a lot of oxygen so but the oxygen is bound to the hemoglobin so first of all the oxyhemoglobin must break down so oxyhemoglobin breaks down and releases the oxygen from the erythrocytes right so this oxygen then diffuses from erythrocytes in the blood into the body cells down the partial pressure gradient from region of higher concentration in the blood to region of lower concentration in the body cells okay now you can see the equation here the reverse equation occurs oxyhemoglobin which is actually uh, quite unstable when it is in a region or area where there is low partial pressure of oxygen for example in the area of the tissues all right then it will break down to form hemoglobin and oxygen once again then this oxygen will diffuse into the body cells so still talking about the transport of oxygen here is a picture that shows what happens what we have discussed just now so here we have the circulatory system the body right the lungs and the tissues so in the lungs the oxygen first diffuses into the blood capillaries and the oxygen will combine with the hemoglobin so the red colored circles here represent the uh, red colored oval shapes represent the erythrocytes or red blood cells okay and the yellow uh, circles here represent the oxygen all right so if we enlarge it we can see that 
in the erythrocyte, there are many hemoglobin molecules, which are the pale orange structures here, and they will bind. The hemoglobin will bind with oxygen to form oxyhemoglobin. So let's just enlarge one of these hemoglobin molecules. Okay, so this is the hemoglobin molecule, and it combines with four oxygen molecules. One hemoglobin molecule to four oxygen molecules. This is oxyhemoglobin, right? HPO2, bracket four. So when partial pressure of oxygen is high in the lungs, hemoglobin combines with oxygen, okay, the orange and the yellow structures, to form oxyhemoglobin. Now then, this oxyhemoglobin, all right, oxyHP here, written as oxyHP, is transported to the body tissues. So when the partial pressure of oxygen is low in the body tissues, oxyhemoglobin breaks down and releases oxygen to the cells. So here again, we see the red blood cell. Now, the hemoglobin has released the oxygen because oxyhemoglo oxyhemoglobin breaks down, all right, and releases the oxygen to the body cells, okay? So here is a picture of the hemoglobin without the oxygen bound to it, okay? Because the oxygen has been released and diffuses into body cells, okay? So oxyhemoglobin is slightly different from hemoglobin, right? Because oxyhemoglobin has uh, oxygen attached to it. And the color of oxyhemoglobin is actually, uh, it, it will make the blood bright red in color. Whereas if it's just hemoglobin without oxygen, the blood will be darker red in color. So far we've discussed gaseous exchange between lungs and blood and the transport of oxygen from lungs to body tissues. Next, for number three, let's discuss gaseous exchange between blood and tissues. So the tissues here are the cells that are found in different parts of the body, which all need oxygen for cellular respiration. For example, tissues in the liver, kidneys, stomach, uh, in the arms and legs, tissues in the wall of the heart, the muscle, muscular tissues, and also in the head and other parts of the body. So all of these tissues need oxygen for cellular respiration. Let's find out more about the diffusion of carbon dioxide and also oxygen in this, these parts of the body. So the third part of our video is to explain gaseous exchange between blood and tissues, body tissues or body cells, eight marks. So for gaseous exchange, we must explain the what happens to two gases, oxygen and carbon dioxide. Remember that, huh? not just oxygen. So when blood reaches the tissues through the tissue capillaries, the partial pressure of oxygen in the blood is higher than that of body cells because cellular respiration uses up oxygen in the body cells, right? So this picture shows you the body cells and the blood capillaries or tissue capillaries. Now, the oxygen has been transported in the red blood cells or erythrocytes, okay, from the lungs, and this is from the lungs, to the body tissues. So, firstly, the partial pressure of oxygen in the body cells is low, lower than that in the blood, because body cells are always using oxygen in cellular respiration to produce energy, right? So, body cells have a low partial pressure which I uh, denote by the symbol P for partial pressure, O2 is for oxygen. So body cells have a low partial pressure of oxygen compared to the blood that is oxygenated. All right, or we can say the partial pressure of oxygen in the blood is higher compared to body cells, all right? Because cellular respiration in body cells uses up the oxygen. Now, next, the oxyhemoglobin in the erythrocytes, in the erythrocytes, will break down to form oxygen and hemoglobin, right? Then the oxygen diffuses from the tissue capillaries or from the blood into the body cells down the partial pressure gradient, from region of high partial pressure to region of low partial pressure oxygen, okay? Now next, how about carbon dioxide? Cellular respiration in cells releases carbon dioxide. 
produces carbon dioxide. This is a waste product. Okay, so it needs to be excreted. Now, then the partial pressure of carbon dioxide in the cells is higher than that in the tissue capillaries in the blood. So the carbon dioxide diffuses from the body cells here into the tissue capillaries of the blood. All right, down the partial pressure gradient from region of high partial pressure of carbon dioxide to region of low partial pressure of carbon dioxide in the blood. In this way, it is, it, after this, it is transported back to the lungs to be excreted. Right, so after gaseous exchange has occurred between the blood and the body tissues, the blood is, will flow back to the heart and then to the lungs. So the blood that enters the lungs is actually deoxygenated blood, okay, and denoted by the blue color here. It's deoxygenated blood. It flows through the pulmonary artery and it has a lower partial pressure of oxygen compared to the blood that flows out of the lungs. So this is because some oxygen has already diffused from the blood into the body tissues before that so that the oxygen can be used in cellular respiration. So therefore, this blood has lower partial pressure of oxygen, about 40 millimeters of mercury. Now, on the other hand, this blood has a higher partial pressure of carbon dioxide compared to the blood that flows out from the lungs, right? So the blood that enters the lungs has higher partial pressure of carbon dioxide or high partial pressure of carbon dioxide because this carbon dioxide diffused out from the body tissues as a byproduct of respiration, right? And the carbon dioxide diffused out from body tissues into the blood to be transported to the lungs for excretion. Right, so next, the last part of our video will focus on the transport of respiratory, the respiratory gas carbon dioxide from body tissues to lungs. This is number four. Okay, so how is carbon dioxide transported from the body tissues to the lungs for excretion? In what form is the carbon dioxide transported? Let's find out more. Right, let's look at the fourth part of our video here. Explain the transport of carbon dioxide, a respiratory gas, from tissues to lungs. Eight marks. So this can be asked as an exam question. Right, the transport of carbon dioxide in the blood circulatory system. Carbon dioxide is transported in three ways in blood. 70% is carried in the form of bicarbonate ions, HCO3- in the blood plasma. Sometimes the bicarbonate ion is called hydrogen carbonate ion because of this hydrogen atom here, right? CO3- minus is the carbonate group. Now, 23% of carbon dioxide combines with hemoglobin to form carbaminohemoglobin in erythrocytes or red blood cells. So hemoglobin does not only bind with oxygen, can also bind with some carbon dioxide to form carbaminohemoglobin. Carbaminohemoglobin. Lastly, a small percentage, 7% is dissolved. 7% of carbon dioxide dissolves in water and forms the carbonic acid. So it's carried as carbonic acid, H2CO3 in the blood plasma. Let's find out how these three substances are formed. Bicarbonate ions, carbaminohemoglobin and carbonic acid. The most important are the bicarbonate ions. Let us discuss the three ways of transport of carbon dioxide from cells to lungs. So this picture shows the area of the body tissues. And on this left side, we can see some body cells, three of them. This pink structure is the blood capillary. And the pink substance here represents the blood plasma, the liquid part of the blood. Then the oval shaped structure here is an uh, enlarged red blood cell, right, or erythrocyte. So we're going to see how the carbon dioxide is transported in the blood. First of all, carbon dioxide is produced in body cells through cellular respiration. So the partial pressure of carbon dioxide in the body cells is higher than the partial pressure of carbon dioxide in the blood because the carbon dioxide is 
constantly produced through cellular respiration in the body cells. Thus, carbon dioxide diffuses from the body cells into the blood. Next, for the first method of transport of carbon dioxide, the carbon dioxide diffuses into the red blood cells or erythrocytes, where it combines with water to form carbonic acid, H2CO3, carbonic acid, H2CO3. And this reaction is catalyzed by an enzyme called carbonic anhydrase in the, in the erythrocyte. Okay, this is an enzyme, carbonic, something related to carbon dioxide, and then anhydrase. The ASE here denotes that it is an enzyme. So this is an enzyme found in the, in the erythrocytes that can help catalyze this reaction, the conversion of carbon dioxide into carbonic acid. Now, this carbonic acid is just an intermediate, intermediate product. Okay, you have to remember this is the intermediate product, carbonic acid. The carbonic acid will break down or dissociate to form two ions, the positive hydrogen ions and the negatively charged bicarbonate ions. So this bicarbonate ions. Sometimes they are known as hydrogen carbonate ions. Okay, bicarbonate ions or hydrogen carbonate ions because of the hydrogen in the front here. The CO3 here represents the carbonate group, right? So bicarbonate ions. Now this bicarbonate ions at first is in the they are in the, the erythrocytes, but after that they will diffuse out into the blood plasma. So 70% of the carbon dioxide in the blood is transported as bicarbonate ions that are in the blood plasma, right? Not in the erythrocyte anymore. Huh? It's in the blood plasma. So this is the main method of transport of carbon dioxide from cells to lungs, to the alveoli in the lungs. Carbon dioxide is transported as bicarbonate ions. So we try to memorize this word. Huh? And always remember that the carbonic acid is the intermediate product. It has to break down or dissociate to form the hydrogen ions and the bicarbonate ions after that for this mode of transport of carbon dioxide. Now let's look at the second method of transport of carbon dioxide. The second method of transport of carbon dioxide is as carbaminohemoglobin. Okay, carbaminohemoglobin. So how is this compound produced? Simple. The carbon dioxide diffuses into the erythrocytes again, but this time it combines with hemoglobin. Okay, the short form for hemoglobin is Hb, hemoglobin. And when carbon dioxide combines with hemoglobin, it forms the compound carbamino hemoglobin. Okay, remember this word, carbamino hemoglobin. Next. Now, how, what's the percentage of carbon dioxide transported as carbamino hemoglobin? 23% of carbon dioxide is transported as carbamino hemoglobin. Now, the third method of transport of carbon dioxide is in the blood plasma. The carbon dioxide diffuses into the blood plasma and it dissolves in, in the blood plasma. So it combines with water to form carbonic acid, H2CO3, same as this one here. It, uh, it, we have discussed before, carbonic acid. But this time it's not in the red blood cell, it's in the blood plasma. So 7% of carbon dioxide in the blood is transported as carbonic acid, right? Okay, so to summarize, the three ways in which carbon dioxide is transported from cells to lungs is in the form of bicarbonate ions, okay? Then secondly, as carbaminohemoglobin, and thirdly, as carbonic acid, all right? So take note also that hemoglobin doesn't only transport oxygen, okay? It doesn't only transport oxygen in the form of oxyhemoglobin. But hemoglobin can also transport some carbon dioxide in the form of carbamino hemoglobin. Right, so we have already discussed the three ways in which carbon dioxide is transported in the blood from body cells to lungs. So here are the notes for the first method of transport. 
that is the formation of bicarbonate ions. So I put it in the form of a question. Explain the transport of carbon dioxide as bicarbonate ions from body cells to lungs. Four marks. Okay, this is, can come out as a structured question. So let's just revise through the first method of transport of carbon dioxide as bicarbonate ions, right? And just fill in some blanks here. And we can copy this as a smart notes. Uh, you can copy this into your notebook. Now, firstly, carbon dioxide is released by the body cells and it binds with water in the erythrocyte, right, to form, okay, what substance? Carbonic acid. Right, so it's here, CO2 plus H2O, carbonic acid, right? Now, what enzyme in the erythrocyte catalyzes this reaction? Yes, it's carbonic anhydrase enzyme. Okay, next. Now, this carbonic acid is an intermediate product, right? So, it breaks down into two ions. What are the two ions? What ion and hydrogen ion? Bicarbonate ion. HCO3. HCO3 minus. Okay, and hydrogen ion. Then lastly, this bicarbonate ion diffuses into the blood what? Yes, plasma. And is carried to the lungs. Okay? So these are the notes for the uh, formation of bicarbonate ions. All right? And to answer this question. Now B, explain the transport or movement of carbon dioxide from lung capillaries or blood capillaries into the alveolus in the lungs. Right? So this is uh, the part that we have not discussed before. Now we know that carbon dioxide is transported as bicarbonate ions to the lungs, right? So when they reach the lungs, what happens? So in the lungs now, you can see the alveolus here and the blood capillary has uh, transported the blood to the lungs, right? So the carbon dioxide is in the form of bicarbonate ions in the blood plasma. Now, how does it, how is the carbon dioxide then produced to diffuse into the, into the alveolus, right? So, a backward reaction occurs. It's like go stun, eh? go stun the car or reverse the car. So, the equations will all go backwards compared to the equations in the previous slide for formation of bicarbonate ions. Okay, now the reaction goes backwards because this reaction is a reversible reaction, forward or backwards. All right, so now it's going backwards because the carbon dioxide must be produced again in the blood to diffuse from the blood into the alveolus, right? So when the bicarbonate ions in the blood, uh, when a bicarbonate ion in blood plasma reaches the lung capillaries here, it's still the blood capillary in the lungs, it diffuses back into the erythrocyte. See, now it diffuses back into the erythrocyte from the plasma. Next, the bicarbonate ion combines with hydrogen ion. So we look at the equation here and we can easily uh, track the movement of the carbon dioxide. Huh? So the bicarbonate ion combines with the hydrogen ion here. Bicarbonate ion, hydrogen ion. They combine to form carbonic acid again. So as we said, carbonic acid is the intermediate compound. Right? So take note of this uh, substance, carbonic acid. Then the carbonic acid breaks down to form carbon dioxide and water. So now the carbon dioxide is no longer dissolved in water in the red blood cell. Now this carbon dioxide then diffuses out from the red blood cell into the blood plasma and then diffuses into the alveolus. All right? So carbon dioxide diffuses from lung capillaries here. This is the lung capillary into the alveolus. Okay? And then it's expelled through exhalation. Here's a quick summary of our video discussion today. Gaseous exchange and transport of respiratory gases. So for oxygen, it diffuses. Oxygen diffuses down its partial pressure gradient from area of high partial pressure 
the area of low partial pressure in two places. A, from the alveolus in the lungs to the blood. And then B, from the blood, from the blood to the tissues or body cells. So that it can be used in cellular respiration in the body cells. Next, for carbon dioxide, it also diffuses down its partial pressure gradient from area of high partial pressure to area of low partial pressure in two places. A, from tissues, where it is produced through cellular respiration, to the blood. And then, after it's transported to the lungs, it diffuses from the blood into the alveolus in the lungs in order to be exhaled or excreted. Lastly, the function of blood is to transport these two gases between the lungs and the tissues. For example, blood transports oxygen in the form of oxymoglobin from the lungs to the body tissues or cells. Whereas blood transports carbon dioxide in the form of bicarbonate ions, carbamine hemoglobin and carbonic acid from the cells to the lungs. So this is the end of the video. I hope you have benefited from it. So in the next video, we'll be discussing some diseases which are related to the lungs. Please do share, like and subscribe. And thanks for viewing. Till we meet again, goodbye.